Two, one, two, three, four. I listen, come let us worship. Come let us worship our feet. Come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven. So oh, hero of heaven. You conquer the day. You free it. Every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have the blame. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have the blame. You've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things that I know. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the day. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have the name. We dance in your freedom, go and get the light. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have the name. All right, let's sing hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, God, above it all. You've done great things, oh hero, no oh, hero of heaven. You conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have the grave. We dance in your freedom, your and the light. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God. You've done, you've done, you've done great things. Oh, let's see who breaks the power. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? So much stronger, the King of Glory, the King of Love of King. Who shakes? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of Glory, the King of Love of King. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love Then you would take my place Then you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free yeah. Ooh, You would not see though, All that you've done for me Who brings out chaos? Who brings out chaos? 
back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of me. Who rules the nations? Who rules the nations? With truth and justice, shine like the sun.
stop second guessing you even when failures come redemption is what you do you're the God who makes weak things strong To build your kingdom here When I feel like When I feel like ruins You see foundations You see foundations To build your kingdom here In my brokenness In my brokenness Made beautiful Let faith like fire burn in our bones. Let hope arise from weary souls. Our hearts cry out, build your kingdom here. My brokenness made beautiful. It's like you said, all things may be. Stand together, sing it again. My brokenness, oh, my brokenness, make you beautiful. It's like you said, all things may be. My heart cries out, feel your deep down here. Let faith, let faith like fire burn. Welcome. It's great to be with you. What a great night of worship we've already had. But we want to say welcome. Yeah, you can applaud that. My name is Jill. I'm one of the Community Life Pastors here. What's up, Saturday night? My name is Marvin. Good to be with you. So we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. If you are new or visiting, we want to say a special welcome. We have a new people's table out in the lobby with some volunteers who'd love to meet you and give you a free welcome gift. So be sure to stop by there after the service. We also have a connection card in your seat backs. You can fill that out as a way of letting us know that you're new and drop it when the offering bags come around in just a moment. Hold we on, Jill. Did you say welcome gift? Yes. We've got a welcome gift for everybody tonight. What is it? We've got iced coffee for everybody. Woo! Just as a way of saying thank you for being here and welcome to each and every one. We have iced coffee in the courtyard after the service. 
We do. So please plan to join us. As a part of that, we want to say welcome to anyone who might be joining us for the first time for our Saturday 6 p.m. service. We know there are some families here who have students across the street at 678. And so welcome. maybe you were at a morning service, but now you're here because your kids are across the street. So we want to say welcome to you. So Everyone is welcome to join us for free iced coffee, but if you are new or you're a new family because of 678, please come find me and Marvin in the courtyard. We would love to meet you. And then as always, we want to say a very special welcome to our, those who are joining us online. So if that's you, welcome and we're glad you're with us. Well, you guys, we have a couple of announcements for us today. First, ladies, so excited. We want to invite you to our upcoming Women's Gathering Fall Kickoff. You can definitely applaud that happening on Wednesday, September 7th at 7 p.m. right here in this room. We will also have an option for you to join us online. And it's just going to be a great night to gather with other women, connect with people, praise God, worship him, and be encouraged from God's word. We will also have free churros, horchata, and coffee afterwards. So please plan to join us. No need to RSVP. You can just invite some friends and plan to join up. And one small note, we want to let you know we will not be providing childcare that night, so you'll want to make other plans. But ladies, we hope to see you there. So in summary, iced coffee tonight and horchata at the women's gathering? Yeah, iced coffee for all, Sounds but like horchata for women. my kind of women. church. All right. Well, I also want to tell you about a really fun thing that we have called the Spiritual Authority Cohort, and that's going to be happening uh, Monday nights beginning September 12th. This is a discovery-based Bible study to help you grow in your prayer life, to encourage, empower, and bless you as you dive in deeper to God's Word and what it has to say about prayer. So if that's of interest to you, details are in your bulletin. You can find out more information on how to join the Spiritual Authority Cohort. And... How many of you guys know that we have lots of parking around Christian Assembly? <laughs> no, I'm serious. We have lots of parking around Christian Assembly. Not necessarily on our lot, but did you know that we have three off-site lights that we off-site off -site lots that we pay for for you to use? So you can park at uh, the Macy's lot over uh, on Colorado. You can park at that big orange building that's on College Street. I was going to call it the ugly orange building that Matt refers it to as, but no, it's just that big orange building there. You can park there as well as the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Ellenwood. So please use all of that parking. It is there for you. Well, at this time, we want to continue in our worship and give honor back to God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And as we do that, let me read to us what we read in God's word in Acts 20, 35. It says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So in just a moment, we'll pass the offering bags. As always, you can give online through our Christian Assembly LA app or on our website. If you're visiting, if you're new, please feel no obligation to give. But to the rest of you, to our Christian Assembly Church family, thank you so much for your ongoing giving and generosity. Would you join me as we get to pray together? Father God, thank you so much for all that you have given to us. Thank you even just for those last many moments of worship, Lord, of just getting to praise you and sing truths about you and who you are. God, thank you for the truth that you sustain us and you strengthen us, Lord. And God, we pray that each of us would follow you until the end, that we would love you until the end, Lord. God, we pray that you would make us faithful and generous people, Lord. And so thank you for your generosity to us and help us to be generous with our finances and with all of the resources and gifts that you have entrusted to us. Lord, bless us, speak to us, throughout the rest of this service. We pray this in your great name, Jesus, amen. The ushers can come forward. Well, it's so great to have this time with you this evening. My name is Matt, if any of you are visiting, and I know that we do have some visitors for baptisms that are gonna be happening later in our service. I'm excited about that. And also wanna greet those of you who are joining us online as well. Uh, by the way, Tom wanted you all to know that uh, he'll be back next week. Um, he's gone again this week. He said, they're going to think I'm never there anymore. Uh, but he and Allie are across the country uh, taking Caleb, helping Caleb, their oldest son, move in uh, to college, his dorm room in college. So it's a, it's a big weekend for the Hughes family. So if you think about them, uh, pray for him this, this weekend. Well, have you ever seen a real ghost town before? Have you ever seen or visited a ghost town? Uh, there's a city near my hometown where I grew up in Texas, 
fact, it's the city that my parents were both born and raised in, uh, that has become virtually a modern ghost town. Port Arthur, Texas was once an impressive, thriving center of industry. In fact, Port Arthur is the birthplace of the Texas oil industry. So, you know, Texas is known for oil. This is where it started. Texaco, if you, if you know that company, started in Port Arthur, Texas. Gulf Oil started in Port Arthur, Texas. It was, it was a major thriving city. In fact, at one time, was second only to New York for foreign imports. Can you believe that? It was a city with a national, even international, significance. And today, that downtown of Port Arthur, Texas, is absolutely empty. No one works there. No one lives there. No one drives through there. There are some people still living on the outskirts of Port Arthur, but the downtown is literally empty and abandoned. It's eerie. In fact, it's a place that gets hit by lots of hurricanes. And there are these tall buildings and tall hotels with all the windows blown out of them from the hurricanes, just, just there, empty. Uh, the, they're the remains, uh, even the remains of a college campus that was in that city, but today it's silent, just an empty shell of an American city. How does that happen? Of course, there are dozens of explanations. If you talk to the locals, some say corrupt leadership, some say the economy, others blame society, the quality of life, or how people lived, and the choices they made. And the truth is that it was probably a combination of failure in all of the above. But the thing is, nobody ever built a ghost town. And nobody ever plans to fail. But in this world, we're all familiar with failure. Anybody ever experienced a little bit of failure in life? Yeah, just a few honest hands and the rest <laughs> laugh about it. Maybe. Yeah, we're all familiar with failure. And in this book of Revelation that we've been going through, John sees Jesus. And as Jesus reveals himself, he also reveals what's true about us and about our world. Jesus reveals to John both destruction and restoration, defeat and victory, failure and reward. And John sees the world marred with sin, passing away under the judgment of God before His holy and awesome throne. And on the throne, John sees Jesus gathering to Himself all who trust in Him as He makes all things new and a restored life with God. And now in chapter 18, John sees a great city in the world become a ghost town. And he reports for us a kind of autopsy of how it happens. He's telling us how failure in this world happens. But he also tells us there's a detour. There's a way to overcome failure and to find life that this world cannot ever offer. And so let's look together at this ghost town in Revelation uh, 18. The verses will be on the screen and in your bulletin as well. John says, after all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. This angel is going to shine some light on what's happening in the world. 
Verse 2, he gave a mighty shout. Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. What's Babylon? I'll come back to that in a moment. But for now, this great city, she's become a home for demons. She's a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture, every foul and dreadful animal. John says, it's a ghost town. Now, for all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world, he says, have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury. The merchants of the world have grown rich. All that that city wanted and longed for and was willing to pay whatever cost for made the merchants of the world rich. Verse 4, Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. This is hope. This is the detour in the story. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins or you'll be punished with her for her sins are piled as high as heaven and God remembers her evil deeds. Look at verse 9. The kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They'll stand at a distance, terrified. What's happened by her great torment? They'll cry out, how terrible, how terrible. Oh, Babylon, you great city. In a single moment, God's judgment came on you. The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for they, there's no one left to buy their goods. They've lost all their customers. She bought great quantities of gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen and purple silk and scarlet cloth. She, she bought things made of fragrant... Tithe. I don't even know what that what, what is. <laughs> and ivory and all these things. Bronze and iron and marble. She paid for it all. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil. This was her grocery list, and she bought it all. And she even bought bodies. You see that? That's human slaves, John says. The fancy things you loved so much are gone. They cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. Look at verse 22. The sound of harps, actually. Singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen, no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived the nations with your sorceries, with your trickery, with whatever it took to get what you wanted. In your streets, flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people and the blood of people slaughtered all over the world. Every chapter of Revelation seems to end in a bloodbath. Have you noticed that? Oh, Lord. What's going on here in this ghost town? John sees a great city and calls it Babylon, which was a, like an epithet for a notoriously godless city of the Old Testament. But here, Babylon is, is long gone when John writes this. He, he uses that name Babylon, but there's a lot of reasons to believe that John is really talking about the city of Rome. And there are also a lot of reasons to believe John is really talking about Jerusalem. Rome was a city doing business all over the world. Jerusalem was a city that other cities and nations exploited for their own gain. 
Rome was violently opposed to Jesus. Remember, he was crucified by the Romans. Jerusalem was also, in John's lifetime, Jerusalem was violently opposed to Jesus. Remember, it was the Jewish high council in Jerusalem that demanded that Jesus be crucified by Rome. In Rome, power and wealth were worshipped. On the, on the other hand, Jerusalem, it was intended to be this place where all the nations of the world would gather to worship the living God. But instead, Jerusalem welcomed and even seduced other nations to share their power and wealth with her. Who needs God's power and authority if you're in bed with the world's kings? Was their attitude. The point is, regardless of whether it's Rome or Jerusalem or Los Angeles or D.C. or Beijing or Tehran or London or Moscow, any city, any empire, any place where people seek to satisfy themselves with power, wealth, and pleasure apart from God will ultimately fail. But there's a detour for life that overcomes failure in this world and produces an endless spring of satisfaction this world cannot offer. And so I want to talk about failure. And then I want to tell you what God offers us in a world so familiar with failure. And then lastly, I want to tell you, the Bible has a a not-so-secret secret to success for overcoming failure. And I want to tell you what that is before we're done. So first, let's notice what Jesus reveals about failure. If, If there was a soundtrack for Revelation chapter 18, it would include the Rolling Stones song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. You know that song? Because I try, and I try, and I try, and I can't get no satisfaction. John sees unrestrained, unhinged, unchecked appetite for power, wealth, and the consumption at all cost of all pleasure, whatever it takes. He sees deception and betrayal and hypocrisy and exploitation. Anything, anything to satisfy every craving. Even enslaving other human beings to ensure no demand is left unmet. People and nations are seducing and being seduced by their great appetites for what they can consume out of this world. And when the biblical writers use such extreme descriptions like this, it's, it's a way, it, it can be sort of uh, leave us disconnected. We can say, well, well, I'm not doing all of those things. But they do that for a couple of reasons. One, because you can find cities and nations and people doing this all through human history. And two, They use these extreme descriptions so that all of us will find ourselves, a little bit of ourselves, somewhere in that. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, warns against this potential of failure in this world. It's a potential in all of us to worship our appetites. He says in a letter to the Philippians, I've told you often before, and I want to say it again, but with tears in my eyes, there are many whose conduct shows they're really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Look, their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. What can I get here? What can I take from the world to satisfy my appetite? And when I'm chasing my own appetites, the problem is a new craving always shows up just around the next corner out of reach. 
Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more because I can't get no satisfaction. Power in this world is useful, but it will fail to do what only the power of God can do. Money is great, but it fails to satisfy the deepest longing in our soul because only Jesus was able to pay the price for that. We can spend our whole lives chasing one pleasure after another and never being satisfied because we were meant, oh, we were meant for more. We were meant for the incomparable pleasure that is only found in the presence of God. Trying to find satisfaction in this world without God is like looking for life in a ghost town. It's not there. You're not going to find it. Jesus is showing John, and John is telling us it's a formula for failure. So what's the hope? John hears a voice of hope. Because God offers us in this world so familiar with failure. Well, look what He offers in Revelation 18, verse 4. It says, I heard another voice calling from heaven, Come away, come away from her, my people. Don't take part in her sins, or you'll be punished with her. John says he heard this voice, and it was a a familiar voice to him. He's heard it several times. It's the same voice he's been hearing calling out from the throne over and over again throughout this revelation. John knows it's his Savior's voice. It's the one on the throne. And John hears Jesus calling, come away! Don't stay in that ghost town. Come take this detour. It's a better way. Once when asked about that song, I can't get no satisfaction, Mick Jagger explained how he wrote those lyrics to that song, where it came from. And he he said it was an expression of alienation. Feeling like nothing this world offers could fulfill what he was looking for. That's so true. He's absolutely right. You and I are meant for life with Almighty God. And nothing in this world will satisfy us apart from Him. Without life with God, this world is a ghost town of hollow temptations. I know what temptation sounds like and looks like and feels like. And I know that you know it too. And I am so grateful that Jesus knows it too. Jesus faced temptation. Temptation is not the failure. Temptation is the human condition. Temptation is noticing the seduction of empty promises. Temptation is an indication that my heart is capable of being drawn in the wrong direction. Temptation is a signpost waving its hand saying, you you were meant for more and you need what this world doesn't offer you. What is it though about us that we all think, I'll be the exception to the rule. I'll be the one who can play in mud and not get any on me. I'll be the one to get away with it. It messes others up, but it's not going to mess me up. I'll know when to stop. I won't do this all the time. I'll just let this happen once. If I don't get caught, what's the harm? Everybody cheats a little bit. And that's why God repeats over and over this call. Come away. Don't go there. That road leads to a ghost town. Turn around. Come away. You were meant for more. You were meant for what is only possible with faith. 
What you are really looking for is the way and the truth and the life. And Jesus said all of that is found in Him. And apart from Him, there is no life as we were meant to live it. In the fall of 2017, I had a lunch with a a friend one day who told me that he was fast. He had started fasting one day a week because he was trying to make more room in his life for prayer, to spend more time in prayer. And so he, one day a week, he would spend the time he usually spent eating praying. And he was telling me about this, but as he was telling me about this, I was thinking in my mind, I hate fasting. <laughs> I really hate fasting. Lord, don't, don't, no. Don't ask me to fast. That's what, that's what I was thinking. Now, I've had those thoughts lots of times. Every time the church calls a fast, in fact. But that day, for some reason... So, something, I just kept one, I, like, I couldn't get it out of my head. I went up, you know, left lunch. I started wondering, why do I hate fasting so much? Why is that so hard for me? And in a Holy Spirit kind of way, those questions just kept bothering me. God ever bothered you about something? And I thought about it for a week, and I finally prayed and and said to the Lord, if there's something, if there's something about that that you want to address, (laughs) kind of like, probably isn't, God. (laughs) But if there's something you want to address, I want to know what it is. Dangerous prayer. Lord, if there's another way of life with you. If you're calling me away to something you want to produce in me that I can't make happen without you, show me that way, Lord. I want your way. Well, over the course of a couple of days, I just began to notice what place food had in my life. I love food. I'm like all of you in the announcements. We're having horchata. Woo! We're having iced coffee. Yeah! Like what people were, I'm sure, someone in this room was thinking, I wonder if they're going to have cookies or anything <laughs> at that thing after the service. But I love food. I really, really like to eat. You can ask Lindsay. I don't miss a meal. I don't like to feel hungry. In fact, I like to feel full. (laughs) And I began began to notice. I'd come home from work, and there are these cabinets in our kitchen. And I would open those cabinets, and it's where we keep crackers and cookies and all kinds of snacks. I'd come home from work, and I'd open those cabinets, and I'd just snack out of those cabinets, talking to Lindsay. She'd be making dinner. I'm just snacking. (laughs) Then I'd sit down and eat dinner, and after dinner, I'd grab another little snack. And then on my way to bed, I'd grab a late-night snack. I, I had, I noticed, an appetite. I began to see that I used food really to feel better about life. And, and I wanted to satisfy that appetite. And as I was realizing this about myself, and as I was thinking about it, I, I remembered something I heard Dallas Willard. Some of you know that author and professor at USC, Dallas Willard. Something I heard him say many years ago. He was talking about the natural human condition to never want to leave a desire unsatisfied. When we want something, we want it. It could be any kind of desire. And then I remember Dallas Willard saying this. He said, take hunger. We don't like to feel hungry. And then he said this. I'll never forget this. 
But being hungry is what it feels like to be alive. The only people who are not hungry are dead. You ever thought about that? And he said, so next time you want to eat just to satisfy a feeling, say to yourself, I'm alive. (laughs) This is what being alive feels like. (laughs) Now, he didn't mean stop eating altogether. We need to eat. But we don't have to eat every time we feel a little hungry. So I started doing that. I'd come home from work. I'd open those cabinets and look at all those crackers and cookies and chocolate-covered almonds from Trader Joe's, and I'd say, Matt, feel alive. (laughs) And I'd close the cabinets. And I found that as I began to do that, that a gratefulness for being alive began to develop in me. I began to not just say, Matt, feel alive, but I began to say, Lord, thank you for life. I feel alive. And that's a gift from you. Help me, Lord, to do with my life what you would have me do. Help me to spend my chance being alive for you. I also ended up losing 20 pounds over the next 12 months. I didn't even set out to do that. I I try to avoid diets at all costs, but, but I felt better than I had in years. I didn't go hungry. I still love to eat. I just stopped letting my appetite determine how I live. You with me? To be alive is to hunger and to thirst and to have desires to want power, to want wealth, to want intimacy, to want gratification, to want. But we don't have to accept the little gods of our appetites. We're called by God to a different way of trusting Him for satisfaction in our souls that this world can never offer. Like that song Tommy wrote years ago, when the best the world has just leaves me feeling numb. Lord, You're really all I want. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 63, Oh God, You're my God. I earnestly search for You. My soul thirsts for You. My whole body longs for You in this ghost town of a world, parched in weary land where there's no water. I've seen You in the sanctuary, gazed upon Your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise You. I will praise You as long as I live, lifting up my hands to You in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I'll praise you with songs of joy. You and I were meant for more than this world can offer, and that is why God calls us away from the empty ghost towns of this world to be satisfied with life that is only possible by faith. And that brings us to the last thing I want to tell you. In fact, Tommy, you can make your way up here if you want to. The Bible's not-so-secret secret to success, how to overcome this failure. It's a life of enduring faithfulness that will overcome the failures of this world. The writer of Proverbs makes this brilliant observation. Many claim to have unfailing love. It's easy to talk a big game But then he asks, who can find a faithful person? Is anybody really willing to walk out their faith all the way to the end? I love that song that we sang that Eileen wrote. Sustain me. Sustain me. Sustain me all the way to the end. 
Anybody really willing to keep on living into complete commitment to Jesus? Anybody willing to fight to hold on to the Word of God even when the pressure is on? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. It's really not a secret in the Bible, but it is something you will not find on your own. Faithfulness has to get produced in you by the Spirit of God. Faithfulness is a God-empowered ability to see myself as I am and to keep believing that God in His grace can make me what I cannot make myself. Faithfulness requires humility to know I need Jesus. I'm not ready-made. I'm not a shoe-in with all it takes from the moment go. But to see that life keeps happening and to see that God isn't through with any one of us yet. And so we just keep walking after Him. We keep looking for the satisfaction He gives. We keep asking, Lord, where's more of Your grace? I want more of You, God. That's faithfulness. The more faithful we are, the more we will serve as a detour sign to help others find their way out of ghost towns and into the satisfaction of knowing the giver of life who reigns forever. It's easy to take a quick fix of empty pleasures. And when you prayed and God didn't answer your prayer the way you expected, well, it's easy to look for something else. When you trusted the Lord to give you what you saw someone else has, and you haven't gotten it, oh, it's easy to start looking somewhere else for the answer. When fear takes the lead in your choices, when people you love let you down, you can begin to wonder, Am I a fool trying to push against the currents in this world? Am I a fool trusting God's way for life? Is it worth it? And Revelation 18 is a shout from God's throne. Oh, it is worth so much more than the emptiness that this world offers us. Faithfulness doesn't often look glamorous in the moment, but in hindsight, a faithful life looks extraordinary. Stay the course. Keep going. Keep believing. Do not give up on the Word of God because it's going to last forever. This, wor this world is going to pass away, but God's love is going to endure and His kingdom will have no end. Do not give up. Do not give in to the emptiness of this world. Don't look in a ghost town for the life that you were meant to live. Not while the one who is the beginning and the end is still on the throne and still holds this world in His hands. He is the one who is still looking for who will receive. My satisfying spirit. Who will receive the satisfaction of knowing life with me that never ends? Can you say amen to that? Amen. We've got the most exciting part of the service tonight. Three people getting baptized. Yeah. And... Baptism is, uh, is really, it's a step of faithfulness. Baptism is, is a way that we literally follow the example of Jesus. And so these three people, they're people just like you and just like me who, who ran into their need for a Savior and found the hope of Jesus Christ. And came to believe that through Jesus, I can have a relationship with God. I can be welcomed by Almighty God to know Him. 
and my life can start over. And we're going to see him in the water in a moment. You're going to see him lay down and come back up. And Paul says it's a picture of dying and rising up with the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's an old life dying away, and Jesus is making all things new in their lives. And notice, they're not going to lay themselves down in the water and lift themselves back up. No, this isn't what we do on our own. But it is a gift from God. And so would you welcome the first to come as Cyan. I'm so glad you're doing this. My name is Cyan. Growing up in a Christian home, going to church, and attending a Christian school, I knew Jesus from a young age. I wanted to have a relationship with God, but sometimes I wasn't sure if I was really hearing and responding to His voice. I often compared myself to others and had trouble making friends. In ninth grade, God led me to CA students and allowed me to play on the worship team. When the students encouraged me to follow Jesus, I recommitted my life to him. Now, following Jesus gives me joy, peace, and boldness. I have felt God comfort me, and I know he has spoken to me about my purpose in life. I love using my gifts to serve him. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, Cyan, hold on just a second. We're so excited about what Jesus is doing in you. This is a little piece of red paper. It's a sticky note. You can stick on the cross there, and it's just a little symbol of the record of your sins canceled on the cross. You can go ahead and walk out to the hallway with Sarah Ann. And Eunice, would you come join me? My name is Eunice. I received Jesus as my Savior five years ago during my freshman year of college when I met a community of students through with a contagious passion for Jesus. It was the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and I was moved by how they showered people with the love of Jesus. I wanted to follow him and be in a personal relationship with him. Saying yes to Jesus has given me the identity and purpose my heart longed for, and knowing that I am his beloved has brought me so much peace and hope into my life. Now, as a registered nurse, I get to share Jesus' heart with my patients and love them as he would. I, I want to be baptized today because I love Jesus and I am committed to following him. That is so awesome, Eunice. I love, I love that those people you met in college, that their love for Jesus and for people was so contagious. And now you're getting to do that as a nurse. Put that on the cross. Your sins are canceled. Nothing held against you. Denise. Come on. My name is Denise. I was 13 when I first asked the Lord into my heart. I felt hopeless at the time, and I remember asking God to show up. Mm. I am grateful that he answered my prayer. In the past 35 years, I have had seasons where I run towards him and other seasons where I have run away from him. I will never know the miracles that the prayers of my family have released in my life. Now I have decided to be baptized with a greater understanding of the magnitude of the decision to trust and follow Jesus. I am choosing to run towards him and receive his anointing as the Lord of my life. Mm, love it. <laughs> a, whole, a whole bus of Denise's families over here. And, and many of you will know Kathy Christopher. This is her niece that's getting baptized. Now. Isn't that awesome? Take that, stick it on the cross. Your sins, Denise, canceled. Nothing held against you, girl. All right, let's get in the water. Say it. Come on down. So that, oh, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. 
will say, and it's because of your faith in Jesus that we now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Eunice, come on in. Eunice, because of your faith in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Denise, come on. Now, she said 34 years, so you guys hold her on uh, under for it. Just, just a little longer. Just a little longer. Denise, you are made new because of your faith in Jesus. We baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 